Hey everyone, Professor Steve here, um, and we're starting to get back into the ocean with this lesson. So just to recap, um, we started off um, ocean circulation by going over the features that that drive sort of the largest, well not sort of, but the largest scale um, phenomenon in ocean circulation, and that's how deep water formation drives this deep water portion of the conveyor belt and how it returns at the surface in a few spots, uh, very important spots in the ocean, and which drives it back to um, the colder spots in the ocean to sink once more and form this global ocean conveyor belt. <clears throat> so next, uh, to sort of address the, 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 the more local, or I should say the ever decreasing uh, scales of ocean circulation, we had to uh, start to um, investigate or, or or learn some of the basics on how fluid media moves on smaller scales and how it responds and reacts with um, with respect to how the Earth rotates. So so we went over Coriolis, which is which is how fluid media the path the apparent path of fluid media moves on the um, on the Earth or on any rotating plane. And then we went over how gravity would make any anything, any fluid media that's piled up, gravity forces that to to um, to uh, be what we call a pressure gradient, higher pressure in one area and lower pressure in another area. And when you have that pressure gradient, you have flow from high to low. Um, and when Coriolis enters the picture, or when you apply Coriolis to that flow on a on, on large scale moving f uh, fluid media, um, you get that you get that rotation, you get the deflected path, right? And so in a higher high pressure system, you get the the, um, the flow moving this way. In the northern hemisphere, it's deflected to the right out of the screen at us, right? And on the left, it's deflected to the right into the screen, and we get this high pressure system which rotates this way, right? and the opposite in a low pressure center because the high pressure is on the outside flow is towards the center so over here deflected to the flow is this way it's deflected to the right this way out of the screen the flow is this way it's deflected into the screen and we get this when we look at it from above for a low pressure center so then we looked at um, air physics and how uh, humidity and temperature set up these individual atmospheric cells, right, that cause um, we have um, low pressure at the at the equators which allows air to rise and then as you get away from the equator you experience some Coriolis and you experience this divergence um, then we get cooling and humidity and we get high pressure which sinks we get the same thing at the poles and this rotation here and here sets up a cell in the middle and so we get these um, alternating uh, zones of, of uh, low, high, low, high pressure. So when we apply that to um, essentially the, the, the entire atmosphere, we get this three-dimensional sort of corkscrewing um, patterns of, of wind bands, right, global wind patterns and they they happen in between these high and low pressure centers right and because of Coriolis they're deflected um, to the right in the northern hemisphere right we go the flow is always from high to low deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere from high to low deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere and it alternates to the right to the right to the right and then the opposite down here so now what we're going to do on th in this lesson um, uh, or the next few lessons, I should say, is go over how this, um, we needed to understand how this sets up, how these global atmospheric b patterns set up, in order to understand how that affects and drives the remaining um, patterns of ocean circulation. Okay, and so we've moved from global, the ocean conveyor belt, to the surface currents. So on top of this large scale, always turning, um, thermohaline circulation, the ocean surface currents, even though it's constantly returning back to the poles to form deep water again, there's this underlying circulation um, of the uh, in, in these in the surface um, that's driven by the winds, right? 
So the winds push it, that's the energy source, and the patterns are driven by, by that wind, but also are governed by the spinning of, of, the, um, of the Earth, obviously, with, with Coriolis. And then they're also guided by, the, by, by things that get in their way. Right, so they're shaped by the sea floor somewhat, but mostly, or um, in the shallows by the sea floor, but mostly that means interactions with the continental boundaries. So the water can be pushed in one direction, but it eventually is going to hit a continent. But let's talk about some of the um, the phenomena or the physics that that guides all of this. <coughs> And very briefly, we'll just talk about flow as it nears a surface. Now, the surface can be, you know, this could be the ocean or any water flowing along the bottom of a lake or an ocean. Um, this can be a fluid medium running next to a flu another fluid medium in a different direction. But this interface here, right, so where, where, they, where they touch, it, it can be considered a surface. And so the flow will be going this way in a constant velocity, um, and when it is constant, we call that laminar flow. Um, but as it starts to approach this interface here, it starts to interact with whatever this other media is. Okay, so let's pretend here that this is the sea floor or a solid surface. As it starts to interact with this solid surface, um, it starts to have this drag. Okay, it's, it's due to friction. And as it starts to drag on here, this this velocity decreases from that friction. And as it gets too slow, it, you can picture it kind of tumbling. Picture yourself sort of walking along at a constant velocity, and then you trip on something, right? Something you interact through friction with something on the floor, and you trip and you tumble. And and this is what causes turbulence. As you get very very close um, to that surface, the actual flow is zero. So so even when you have two fluid media. Um, interacting with each other, where they actually touch, the, the velocity is zero. And now that layer of zero can be very, very tiny, almost unmeasurable, but it's there. <clears throat> and as I said, you can have it not just with f uh, fluid media passing a solid um, m media, like the sea floor, the water flowing over sea floor, but you can have fluid media um, against fluid media. It could be fluid media, it could be wind going in opposite directions. You're going to have this shear zone in here where there's turbulence, and somewhere in here is a very thin line of zero flow. Um, you can get this with um, with something that's not necessarily moving in opposite directions, but just has two different velocities, a very high velocity layer driven by something, moving past the very low velocity something, and you'll get this interface in here, and you'll get this turbulence. Now these pieces of each other that start to mix together from this turbulence, right, we get this mixing in these little patches that swirl out in these little eddies, Okay, we describe that as eddy viscosity. It doesn't even ha doesn't have to be velocity either, right? We can say different viscosities, right? So fluid media wind versus something like water. Okay, so if wind is pushing over water, it's such a strong difference in in viscosity um, that you're going to have this friction and interaction in here. And indeed, we do, right? So as these global wind patterns are constantly pushing on the ocean, the the friction that the wind has with the ocean transfers its energy to that ocean, right? And 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 when it in that transfer, it's actually pushing. So the water has to do something with that energy transfer. Um, now uh, we will talk about how that forms um, your regular everyday wave that you see it crashing on the beach, but that's not really the topic for today. But the point of this is to show that um, when that energy transfers, it decreases with depth, right? The wind pushes here, the maximum energy transfer through that friction is, is at the top, and as we get deeper and deeper and deeper, we lose that energy. And the reason we talk about that <coughs> is so that we can go over the phenomenon that happens that really governs how the entire surface currents move. Um, and that's described by something called the Ekman spiral, discovered by a man named Ekman, a guy much smarter than I am for sure. And what he discovered was that when you have a large fluid media, so let's just talk about the ocean from now on, um, moving, it has that deflection due to Coriolis, right? It deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. But what they noticed was it moves in a way that we're not entirely comfortable with. It doesn't just deflect slightly, right? And the fact of the matter is that we have the wind pushing here, you get that maximum amount of friction and energy transference, and what happens is it deflects just 
about 45 degrees to the right the layer of water right below it. But then that water, that layer right below it, is moving now 45 degrees to the right, and it is transferring its energy to the next layer down right here, and it's pushing that layer, but at a 45 degree angle to the right of that. And then that one's now moving 45 plus 45, which is 90 degrees, which is pushing on the layer below it, right, which is pushing on the layer below it, another 45 degrees to the right, another layer below it, 45 degrees to the right, another layer below, and so on and so forth. And so we get this spiral of 45 degree um, media movement, um, but it's in a de decreasing um, value of energy, right? The energy that it's pushing and moving, and the amount that it's moving is less and less and less, okay? The depth, right, the stronger the wind, the stronger this depth happens, right? The, str the, the deeper this effect happens and the stronger these arrows are, and that depth that it reaches to, whatever it is, is called the Ekman layer, and that's dependent on the wind strength. If you integrate now, if anybody remembers integrals from calculus, if you integrate the net effect of this, it's just that the water moves 90 degrees to the right. So it's a very complicated mathematical um, <coughs> description that describes this, or, or equations that describe this, but it's a very simple outcome. And the fact is that when the wind moves this way, okay, whatever direction the wind is moving, it's pushing on a fluid media, the net transport of that is 90 degrees to the right, okay, and we call that Ekman transport. Okay, so if the wind is moving this way, wind is moving north in the northern hemisphere, the water is moving 90 degrees to the right of the wind, always. Okay, and then remember in the southern hemisphere it's the opposite, it's 90 degrees to the left. Wind in the linear direction, water 90 degrees to the right, or complete right angle. <coughs> So now if we take a look at our global wind zones, again, our, our, our large-scale global wind patterns, how does that affect it, right? So we say the winds go from high to low, and those are deflected to the right. But if it's pushing on the ocean in this direction, then which way does the water go in the right, uh, in the northern hemisphere? It's deflected to the right, right? High to low, the wind is deflected this way. The northern hemisphere pushes the water to the right. Okay, and a little bit of this happens up here, but so this is this is imagining that there are no continents in the way of the ocean, and you can see here that the wind's going this way, the water's going this way, the wind's going this way, water's going this way. You could start to sort of envision this circular pattern of water movement, right? And we get the same thing in the southern hemisphere, but the wind's going from high to low, but the wind is directed to the left, pushing the water to the left, right? high to low to the left pushing the water to the left and so we get an opposite circular pattern in the in the southern hemisphere and we'll leave that there as an intro to um, to uh, to the next lesson thanks very much guys